Hello everyone, so let's start a very interesting hour which is the dual nature of matter and photoelectric effect. Actually, we study dual nature of matter because of photoelectric effect. Now this is going to be a simple hour, a scoring hour and one question from here will come in your NEET examination. So without wasting time, let's start this hour where I will first talk about dual nature of matter and then I will talk about photoelectric effect. So let's start. So let's talk about matter waves, which are also called de Broglie waves. So according to de Broglie, a moving material particle, a moving material particle exhibit both wave as well as particle nature. So even if you start moving, there is a wave nature associated with your motion. Now the big question comes that if when I move, I have got a wave nature associated with me. Why have I never observed it? Because of this. There is a wavelength associated with the motion of the particle and the wavelength is given by a formula. So according to de Broglie theory, the wavelength of a de Broglie wave is given by the formula wavelength equals to Planck's constant upon the momentum. Now I assume that you have a mass of 50 kg and you are moving with a speed of 10 meter per second. So your momentum will be equals to 500 kg meter per second. If I ask you when you move with the speed of 10 meter per second, which is a huge speed, what will be the wavelength associated with your motion? You will say that sir, wavelength has to be nothing but h by p and we know that the value of Planck constant is 6.6 .6 into 10 to the power of minus 34 upon your momentum when you move at speed of 10 meter per second that is 500 so take it like 10 to the power of minus 34 and think of the denominator as 5 into 10 to the power of 2 rather than 500 so in numerator you have got minus 34 in denominator you have got 10 to the power of 2 take it like the wavelength is of the order of 10 to the power of minus 36. now while teaching you interference and diffraction i said that to observe diffraction the side of the opening or the size of the particle should be of the order of wavelength. That's why Mr. Thomas Young made the slits using a blade so that the openings will be ultra fine so that the opening will have the size of the order of wavelength. When you are moving, the wavelength associated with your motion is of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 36 meter. What is the size of an atom? Sir, of the order of angstrom, 10 raised to the power of minus 10 meter. What is the size of a nucleus, sir, of the order of Fermi, 10 raised to the power of minus 15 meter? If we have to observe our wave nature, we should either pass through an opening of size of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 36 meter or we should interact with particles of the size of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 36 meter and from the example I gave you for atom, I think that you must have understood that this is not possible. That's why observing your and mine wave nature is not possible because we have got huge momentum. Since we have got huge momentum and Planck's constant itself is a very small number. So the ratio comes out to be even very small. So lambda equals to h by p where p is nothing but momentum. So in place of p, we can even write mv. Now we know that kinetic energy is nothing but half mv square. Yes, sir. If we multiply mass in both numerator and denominator, we can write it this way as well. So I can even say that the kinetic energy associated with the motion of a particle is equal to the momentum whole square by 2m. Or on rearrangement, I can say that the momentum equals to under root of 2me. So in place of momentum, I can even write under root of 2me. And we can write the wavelength as h upon under root of 2me. So if I ask you a simple question, if the speed becomes double, what happens to the de Broglie wavelength associated with the motion? You will say it becomes half because lambda is inversely proportional to V. And do understand that lambda is inversely proportional to under root of kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy becomes four times, lambda becomes half. If the kinetic energy becomes 16 times, lambda becomes one fourth. Now, do understand that lambda is inversely proportional to momentum, is inversely proportional to speed and is inversely proportional to under root of energy. So if the energy becomes two times, lambda becomes one by root two times. You should be able to do these small transformations easily. Now, beta, do understand that here H is Planck's constant, 
m is the mass of the particle v is the speed of the particle and e is the kinetic energy of the particle so now talking about de broglie wavelength associated with an electron or as a matter of fact associated with any charged particle when it has been accelerated through some potential difference the energy of a charged particle accelerated through a potential difference v is given by let's say you have a charged particle having a charge q and this charged particle is accelerated through a potential difference v then we say that the kinetic energy gained by the charged particle is nothing but q v so we can say that the kinetic energy gained by the charged particle that can be written as half mv square can also be written as q v now we can say that the de broglie wavelength associated with the motion of this charged particle which is equals to h by p times constant by momentum and rather than momentum we can even write under root of 2 m times kinetic energy and rather than writing energy here we can even write charge times the potential difference qv so we can say that the de broglie wavelength associated with a charge q of mass m when accelerated through a potential difference v is given by h upon under root of 2 m q v so if the potential difference becomes four times if the applied potential difference across which the charge particle has been accelerated becomes four times the de broglie wavelength becomes half you should be able to do this really quick now bachcho the question which comes in your neat examination is for electron that's why in the heading we have said electron they will say that an electron has been accelerated through a potential drop of let's say 50 volt tell me what is the de broglie wavelength associated with this electron because you already know what is the mass of electron and charge of electron they expect you to answer this question just by giving you potential difference v and as planck's constant is known so there is a simpler formula to solve this we say that the de broglie wavelength associated with an electron when it is accelerated through a potential difference v is given by 12.27 by root v angstrom and rather than remembering 12.27 what i personally use is under root of 150 by v angstrom under root of 150 comes out to be nearly 12.27 now if in the question they give you that an electron is accelerated through a potential drop of 100 volt and ask you what is the de broglie wavelength associated with the motion of this electron once it has been accelerated through a potential drop of 100 volt your answer is easy you will say that the de broglie wavelength associated is nothing but under root of 150 by 100 angstrom which is under root of 1.5 angstrom comparatively easier to calculate rather than dealing with planck's constant mass of electron charge of electron so i recommend you to remember this particular formula and you will find question came from here many a time in previous years now bachcho if rather than electron they give you a thermal neutron because thermal neutrons are important in the chapter of radioactivity so what is the energy of a thermal neutron at ordinary temperature so we know that the energy associated with a neutron having an average temperature t is 3 by 2 kt so beta rather than here substituting energy e substitute the energy as 3 by 2 kt so you get the de broglie wavelength to be equals to h upon under root of 2m into 3 by 2 kt when you have got h upon under root of 2m times 3 by 2 kt this 2 and 2 get cancelled so what you get is under root of 3 mkt so lambda is proportional to 1 by root t so if the temperature becomes four times the de broglie wavelength becomes half if the temperature becomes nine times the de broglie wavelength becomes one third but here remember that you have to take the temperature on the absolute scale on the kelvin scale not on degree celsius scale so bachcho you need to remember this simple formula you have learned this thing already in ktg now beta remember that here k is nothing but boltzmann constant and the value of boltzmann constant is 1.38 into 10 raised to power of minus 23 joule per kelvin i hope that they will give you this data in your examination paper so let's move on and talk about characteristic of matter wave the first one matter wave represents the probability of finding a particle in space 
second matter waves are not electromagnetic in nature so they do not have component of electric field and magnetic field oscillating they are not electromagnetic in nature third de broglie or matter wave is independent of the charge on the material particle so if you have got a material particle of 4 kg moving with a speed of 2 meter per second irrespective of the charge on this material particle to be 2 coulomb or 6 coulomb or 8 coulomb you will get the same value of de broglie wavelength so de broglie or matter wave is independent of the charge on the material particle it means that the matter wave de broglie wave is associated with every moving particle whether charged or uncharged we have already learned that what is the de broglie wavelength associated with a moving neutron and neutron is neutral right next question practical observation of matter waves is possible only when the de broglie wavelength is of the order of the size of the particle it is interacting with or of the order of the size of the opening through which this matter wave passes the next point electron microscopes work on the principle of de broglie waves you need to know that when i heard first time the term in my life electron microscope and they said that in an electron microscope we use electron to understand the structure i was like how can you use electrons to understand the structure because electrons are not like light electrons are not like x-rays but do understand that even particle acts like wave and electron microscope work on the basis of de broglie waves when electrons even act like wave next question the electric charge has no effect on the matter wave or their wavelength this is something that we have already talked about in the third point now this fifth point i am going to talk about more we will talk about a very important experiment in the world of physics that is davison and german experiment this experiment proved the de broglie's hypothesis to be right i have already talked with you that if you have a mass of 50 kg and if you start moving with certain speed your wavelength will be very very small and observing your wave nature will be very very difficult but let's assume the case of an electron an electron has got mass of 9.1 into 10 to the power of minus 31 kg and even if an electron moves at a humongous speed of let's say 10 to the power of 4 meter per second or 10 to the power of 6 meter per second then you will say that the momentum associated with the motion of this electron will be of the order of mass times speed so that will be of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 27. if we think of the order of the wavelength associated with the motion of this electron we will say that the de broglie wavelength equals to h by p the Planck's constant is of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 34 and the momentum with a moving electron is of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 27 i get the wavelength of the order of 10 raised to the power of minus 7 meter that can be thought of as 100 nanometer and this is something that can be detected because we have seen interference and diffraction for visible light and they have even wavelength of the order of nanometer so this is something that can be detected so what davison and germer did they took an electron gun what is an electron gun in an electron gun we have got a battery let's say of emf e1 and this battery is connected with a coil so as we have connected the battery with a coil some current flows through it and as the current flows through it the coil get heated up when the coil gets heated up due to thermionic emission some electrons come out of it so if you increase the value of e1 more current will flow through the coil more current will flow through the coil more heat will be dissipated and more number of electrons will come out of the coil and then they connected this part with another battery now see here the polarity of the second battery i have kept right hand side positive and left hand side negative so this part of the plates connected through a wire will be positive while this part will be negative so once the electrons have came out due to the thermionic emission they will be accelerated through some potential difference they will be attracted towards this positive charge and there is a gap through these gap the electrons can escape let's say this battery has an emf e2 so e2 will decide 
that how much will these electron accelerate how high the kinetic energy they will have after coming out if you increase the value of e2 then electrons after coming out once they are accelerated through this potential difference will gain greater kinetic energy so when you increase e2 the kinetic energy of the electron coming out increases and this whole setup is called electron gun i am repeating here once more if you increase e1 then more number of electron will come out and if you increase e2 then the electrons coming out of the electron gun will have greater kinetic energy and we know that the de broglie wavelength is nothing but h by under root of 2m times kinetic energy so if you make the accelerating potential four times the kinetic energy becomes four times and the de broglie wavelength becomes half now once davison and germer have accelerated these electrons and the electrons came out of the electron gun they shot them over a nickel crystal now when these electron hit the nickel crystal what was expected that after these electrons would have hit the nickel crystal if they are particles they will be scattered in all directions but moving a detector we found that at a particular angle the concentration of the electrons getting scattered was way higher so if we plotted the graph of theta that is the angle at which the detector is placed versus the intensity of the electron found we found a peak there and this peak was in accordance with the bragg's law mr bragg gave the law for x rays he said that if there is a crystal in which the separation between two layer of spacing is d and radiation of wavelength lambda falls on it at some angle theta and these rays after getting reflected from the first surface and from the second surface undergo constructive interference then the gap the angle theta and the wavelength must have a relationship and that relationship is called bragg's law and that is given by 2d sin theta equals to n lambda mr bragg gave this law for x rays which are em waves but davison and germer found that this formula is even working for the electrons and how they substituted the value of wavelength for electron using the de broglie hypothesis which said that the wavelength associated has to be equal to h by under root of 2 me and hence verified that even electron acts like wave so it is used to study the scattering of electron from a solid or to verify the wave nature of electron so davison and germer experiment was the experiment which verified the wave nature of electron the wave nature of a particle a beam of electron emitted by electron gun is made to fall on a nickel crystal cut along a cubical axis at a particular angle why do we do this leave it for now nickel crystal behave like a three dimensional diffraction grating and it diffracts the electron beam obtained from the electron gun now look at the statement here diffracts the electron beam as if the electron beam is acting like a wave so here is the diagram we have got something called electron gun there is a filament through which some current is run because of which electron comes out once electron comes out they are accelerated through a potential difference controlling this emf controlling the potential difference through which they have been accelerated we can control the de broglie wavelength because the de broglie wavelength equals to h by under root of 2 me and you know that e for electron will be nothing but the charge e multiplied by the accelerating potential now these electrons once accelerated are hit once they are hit they get diffracted and we know that we will observe a maxima when 2d sin theta will be equals to n lambda and it was observed that we find a maximum so if the de broglie wave exists for electrons 
then these should be diffracted as X-rays. X-rays are EM waves. You are expecting electron to get diffracted just like X-rays, just like EM waves. It means that you are expecting particle to show wave nature. Using the Bragg's, Bragg's equation 2d sin theta equals to n lambda, we can determine the wavelength of these waves. And the wavelength were found to be in accordance with the de Broglie hypothesis. And hence, Davison and German experiment confirmed that even particle shows wave nature. So let's move on and now talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg uncertainty principle is based on you can't be 100% certain. So according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it is impossible to measure simultaneously both the position and momentum of the particle perfectly. You can't be 100% certain there has to be some scope of uncertainty. And it goes like let delta x and delta p be the uncertainty in simultaneous measurement of position and momentum of a particle. So beta, what is delta x? Error in the measurement of the position of the particle. What is delta p? Error in the measurement of the momentum of the particle. So if you measure the position and the momentum of a particle simultaneously and delta x and delta p represents the error in the measurement of position and momentum, then the multiplication of them, the error in the measurement of position and the error in the measurement of momentum their multiplication has to be greater than equal to h by 4 pi. It means that if you know the position really well, delta x becomes 0, then delta p should become infinite. So if you know the position really well, you won't know what is the momentum of the particle. And if you know the momentum really well, if you know the momentum really well, it means that the error in the measurement of momentum tends to 0 then the error in the measurement of position will be infinity. So if you know the momentum really well, then you do not know where the particle is. You have got no certainty in the position of the particle. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that the error in the measurement of position multiplied by error in the measurement of momentum should be greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. Now let's move on and talk about photon. According to Einstein's quantum theory, light propagates in bundle, which are packets or quanta. Beta quanta means the smallest indivisible unit. Quantum. So, according to Einstein's quantum theory, light propagates in the bundles, packets or quanta of energy, each bundle being called a photon and each photon has some energy with it. Now, what is the energy of a photon? So, if you have got a light of frequency f, then you can write energy of one photon as hf. Or you can write energy of one photon for a light of wavelength lambda to be equals to sc by lambda. And I think you know this already. So, energy can be written as Planck's constant times frequency. Or energy can be written as sc by lambda. And I am quite sure you knew this already. So, move on. Energy of a photon is usually useful in the term of electron volt. Why? We will talk about this a little later when I discuss about photoelectric effect. But do remember that this is a very useful thing. So how to write the energy of a photon in electron volt? So we say that the energy in electron volt is given by 12400 upon lambda in angstrom. So if I ask you that we have got a particular photon of wavelength, let's say 200 nanometer. Can you tell me what is the energy associated with this photon in electron volt? So you will say that, sir, rather than thinking of first wavelength in nanometer, think of it in angstrom. So we can say that 200 nanometer is as good as 200 into 10 to the power of minus 9 meter. That can be written as 2000 into 10 to the power of minus 10 meter. And that can be written as 2000 angstrom. Now, the energy associated with this particular photon in electron volt will be nothing but 1, 2, 4, double, 0 upon wavelength in angstrom. So divided by 2000. So you will cancel out 0, 0, 0, 0. Cancel this 0 and write it as 12.4. And then divide it with 2. You will get 12.4 divided by 2 will be 6.2. And the unit will be electron volt. 
so if you have got a photon of wavelength 200 nanometer it has the same energy as when you will get when you accelerate an electron through a potential drop of 6.2 volt when you accelerate an electron through a potential drop of 6.2 volt the, the energy that electron will possess will be 6.2 electron volt and this will be really useful in the topic of photoelectric effect so just remember the energy of photon in electron volt equals to 12400 upon lambda substituted in angstrom number two what is the mass of photon so actually the rest mass of photon is zero so if the photon is at rest then its mass will be zero but its kinetic mass is found using the einstein's mass energy equivalence as per einstein's mass energy equivalence which every kid know nowadays e equals to mc square so the mass has to be nothing but the energy upon c square and actually in his work einstein everywhere wrote the mass of a system is nothing but the total energy content divided by the speed of light whole square so as we know that e equals to mc square we can even write m equals to e by c square and we already know what is the energy associated with one photon energy associated with one photon can be written as either hf or sc by lambda so you can say that the mass associated with a photon equals to hf by c square or hc by lambda upon c square that become h by lambda c so this is how we can write the mass of a photon and this is really useful many a time so how do we find the mass of a photon using the einstein's mass energy equivalence equation second thing but two do remember that the rest mass of photon is zero this also comes from another of einstein's equation that the moving mass equals to rest mass upon under root of 1 minus v by c whole square if the photon will have any rest mass and since we know that photon moves at speed of light then the moving mass of photon will become infinity why because when you substitute c in place of v you get c by c and c by c becomes one so you will get m equals to m naught upon under root of one minus one that becomes m naught by zero so the moving mass has to be infinity do you think that when you turn on the button of light in your room you feel that infinite mass is hitting you no you don't and the reason being the rest mass is zero so since the numerator is also zero and denominator is also zero you get a zero by zero indeterminacy so just remember for now the rest mass of photon is zero and why the rest mass is zero because from einstein's another equation if the rest mass won't be zero then the kinetic mass of the photon should be infinite and we know that the kinetic mass is not infinite that's why the rest mass has to be equals to zero now but you, how to write the momentum of photon so momentum is nothing but mass times the speed so we know that the photon moves at speed of light yes and we have already computed its momentum and we have already computed its mass the mass can be written as hf by c square or as h by c lambda so you can substitute in place of mass h by c lambda and what you get is momentum equals to h by c lambda times c and cancel out c and c you get momentum equals to h by lambda now you might get from where does de broglie got his idea the momentum of photon equals to h by lambda yes so the wavelength of photon equals to h by p yes de broglie said that a photon shows dual nature light shows both wave nature as well as particle nature so everything should show wave nature as well as particle nature it was a very brave hypothesis when he gave it and nobody believed it until unless it was proven on ground that even particles like electron proton alpha particles show wave nature and that's why this particular equation lambda equals to h by p is so important so once you have known what is the energy of photon mass of photon momentum of photon let's move on and talk about number of photons emitted by a source the number of photons emitted per second 
from a source of monochromatic radiation of wavelength lambda when i say monochromatic radiation it means that it gives out photon of only one wavelength lambda and power p is given by so if you have a light source let's say a bulb and it gives out radiation it gives out radiation in the form of photon it gives out energy in the form of photon and if this power source has a power p how to find the number of photons emitted by it per second it's quite easy one know that the power emitted is nothing but the energy dissipated per unit time yes sir now this bulb gives out energy in the form of photons so the total energy given out from this bulb will be nothing but the total number of photons coming out number of photons coming out multiplied by energy of one photon so if you write the total energy radiated by this bulb as number of photons coming out multiplied by energy of one photon and then place the time again our mission is to find the number of photons emitted per unit time so can i say that the number of photons emitted per unit time is nothing but power divided by energy of one photon so we can say that the number of photons emitted per unit time is nothing but power of the energy source upon the energy of one photon now we can write the energy of one photon as hf or we can write it as sc by lambda substituting it we get p upon hf do understand that this p is not momentum this is power of the energy source and here in place of e we can even write sc by lambda the lambda moves from denominator of denominator to the numerator and you get power times wavelength upon sc so what is e here e is the energy of one photon energy of every single photon now but your next thing we need to talk about is intensity of light so intensity is the energy crossing per unit area normally per second and this is also called energy flux so intensity is also called as energy flux you should know it so what is the formula for intensity intensity is nothing but energy crossing per unit area per unit time and we can say that the energy crossing per unit time can also be written as power so the intensity can also be written as power upon the area so intensity equals to energy per unit area per unit time and rather than writing e by t energy crossing per unit time you can write the power dissipated per unit area as the intensity so here what is e by t e by t can be written as power which is the power radiated now bachcho at a distance r from a point source of power p the intensity is given by so if you have a point source of power p it is continuously giving out photons if i ask you what will be the intensity at distance r so you will say that the energy coming out of this point source at a distance r will be distributed over a sphere of radius r and this sphere of radius r will have a surface area 4 pi r square so one can say that the intensity will be equal to the power upon the area over which that power gets distributed so the intensity will be nothing but power upon the area over which that power is distributed so p upon 4 pi r square so do remember for a point source intensity is proportional to 1 upon r square we are going to use this later in this chapter only so due to a point source if at distance r the intensity is i then at a distance 2 r the intensity is i by 4 at a distance 3 r the intensity will be i by 9 because intensity is proportional to 1 upon r square for a point source now bachcho let's start the important topic of this r which is the photoelectric effect now the first terminology we need to understand for photoelectric effect is something called wolf function or the threshold energy and the symbol we are going to use for it is w not so the minimum energy of incident photon the minimum energy of incident photon required to eject the electron from metallic surface is defined as work function if you let's say have a metal crystal let's say made up of iron 
it will be easier to remove the electron present on the surface and more difficult to remove the electron present in the inner layers what is work function the minimum energy of incident photon required to eject the electron from the metallic surface is defined as the work function the minimum energy required to take out the electron is work function minimum energy now beta the next term we need to understand is threshold frequency what is threshold frequency the minimum frequency of the incident radiation required to eject the electron from the metal surface is defined as the threshold frequency so what has to be the minimum frequency of this incident photon so that it will be able to take out an electron that minimum frequency is called the threshold frequency we know that for a photon the energy of photon can be written as hf yes sir so if the frequency increases the energy increases if the frequency decreases the energy decreases so a low frequency photon will have less energy and a high frequency photon will have more energy yes sir the minimum frequency of the photon required to eject an electron from the metal surface is called the threshold frequency now to understand that if the incident frequency is less than the threshold frequency written as f0 if the incident frequency is less than the threshold frequency then electron won't come out you won't observe any photoelectric emission so for the electrons to come out the frequency of the incident photon should be greater than the threshold frequency this is a must next point what is threshold wavelength the maximum wavelength of incident radiation sir for frequency you said minimum and for wavelength you are saying maximum yes there is a reason we write the energy of photon as hf or as sc by lambda if you increase the frequency energy increases if you increase the wavelength energy decreases so let's say there is a particular photon which is just able to take out an electron from the metal surface if you increase the frequency the energy of photon will increase and it will still be able to take out the electron but if rather than increasing the frequency you increase the wavelength the energy of the photon will decrease and now it won't be able to take out the electron so the statement goes like the maximum wavelength of incident radiation required to eject the electron from metallic surface is defined as threshold wavelength so this is something important you should focus here for some time i say minimum frequency and the maximum wavelength and there is a reason behind it why now if the incident wavelength is greater than threshold wavelength it means that the incident energy of the photon is less than the minimum energy required to take out the electron so if the incident wavelength is greater than threshold wavelength then you won't observe any photoelectric emission no photo electrons will come out of the metal surface now work function and threshold frequency is something we should be able to find so we know that work function has to be equals to hf not survive because what is work function so work function is the minimum energy required to take out the electron what is threshold frequency so threshold frequency is the minimum frequency of the photon which is able to take out the electron so the energy of the photon should be equal to the work function no? that's why we say that if a photon has got frequency same as the threshold frequency then its energy has to be equal to work function so beta here work function equals to hf not where f not is the threshold frequency if you think in terms of threshold wavelength then the work function can also be written as sc by lambda not where lambda not is the threshold wavelength so it do remember this correlation that work function equals to h times the threshold frequency equals to sc by the threshold wavelength so here f not is threshold frequency and lambda not is threshold wavelength now let me ask you a simple question let's say you have a metal okay and the work function for this metal is given to be 4 electron volt what is the meaning of it 
सर द मिनिमम एनर्जी रिक्वायर्ड टू टेक आउट एन इलेक्ट्रॉन फ्रॉम इट्स सरफेस इज फोर इलेक्ट्रॉन वोट इफ आई आस्क यू वट इज द थ्रेश होल्ड वेव लेंथ वॉट विल बी योर आंसर सर द मिनिमम एनर्जी ऑफ द इंसिडेंट फोटोन इफ द इंसिडेंट फोटोन हैज टू टेक आउट एन इलेक्ट्रॉन शुड बी इक्वल टू द वर्क फंक्शन फोर इलेक्ट्रॉन वोल्ट and we know that the energy of photon in electron volt is nothing but 1240 upon lambda in angstrom so we can say that the wavelength in angstrom has to be nothing but 12400 upon the energy of photon required in electron volt if we want that this photon should be able to take out the electron the minimum energy that this incident photon should have has to be 4 electron volt if this photon should have energy of 4 electron volt what has to be the wavelength so you will say the wavelength has to be 12400 upon energy in electron volt which is 4 that comes out to be 3100 angstrom so the wavelength has to be minimum equals to 3100 or maximum equal to 3100 now here you have to think about it think that another photon of wavelength 3000 angstrom will have more energy or less energy sir for photon e equals to sc by lambda yes so if lambda decreases energy increases yes so if the photon of wavelength 3100 angstrom is able to take out the electron then even the photon of 3000 angstrom is capable of taking out electron but since 3100 is your threshold wavelength any photon of wavelength 3200 angstrom won't be able to take out the electron why because sir 3200 angstrom is higher wavelength lesser energy the photon of wavelength 3200 angstrom will be weaker so that won't be able to take out the electron and that's why dealing with this particular formula becomes important i will ask you more question but after explaining little bit more So now let's talk about Einstein's photoelectric equation, and this is the important part. And for this equation, Mr. Einstein got Nobel Prize. So, if an electron in the metal absorbs a photon of energy e, and let's say frequency f, so e has to be equal to h f, it uses the energy in three of the following ways. The first, some energy, say w, is used in shifting the electron. from the interior to the surface of matter so let's say there is this electron within the metal and you have got here incident photons falling on this metal once this electron has absorbed the photon it can use the energy in three ways first some part of the energy gained by this electron will be used to move from bulk to the surface and let's say this energy used is w so some energy w is used in shifting the electron from interior to the surface of matter which electron as there will be many present in this metal will absorb the photon and will not have to waste any energy to move to the surface or the surface electron for the surface electron this energy w will be equal to zero next watch some energy say w not the work function is used in making the surface electron free from the matter so once this bulk electron has absorbed the photon some part of the energy will be utilized in moving from bulk to surface and then to come out of the surface we know that there is a minimum amount of energy required and that energy is the work function so then further w not will be used to come out of the surface and then the rest of the energy will appear as kinetic energy k of the emitted electrons for example let's take some number here let's say there is an electron present in the bulk okay and you hit here a photon and this photon has got energy of 12 electron volt if i tell you that the work function for this particular material is 2 electron volt and the energy required for this electron to move from bulk to the surface is 6 electron volt can you tell me what will be the kinetic energy of this electron after coming out of the metal so you will say sir you have provided the electron with an energy of 12 electron volt okay 
out of this 12 electron volt 6 will be utilized to reach the surface yes so now left will be 6 electron volt then to leave the surface the energy required is equal to work function so out of the 6 electron volt remaining the further 2 electron volt will be utilized in coming out of the surface so after coming out of surface this particular electron will have kinetic energy of 6 minus 2 4 electron volt let's take one more example let's say you have got this particular electron present in the bulk i tell you the energy spent by this electron to move from bulk to the surface is 5 electron volt then the energy spent by this electron to come out of the surface which is nothing but work function is 6 electron volt and after coming out i find that this particular electron has got kinetic energy of 6 electron volt then tell me what is the energy absorbed by this electron from the incident photon so you will say that sir let's say this incident photon provides some energy e out of this energy e first five electron volt is spent in reaching the surface the next six electron volt which is called work function will be utilized in coming out of the surface and even after coming out of surface it still possesses a kinetic energy of 6 electron volt this means that the total energy incident must be equal to 5 plus 6 plus 6 that will be equals to 17 electron volt so now hence we can say an equation the energy of the incident photon e equals to w plus w naught plus k so energy of the incident photon equals to the energy utilized in moving from bulk to surface plus work function that is the energy required to escape from the surface plus the kinetic energy after coming out of the surface now better think that here in this metal we have got infinite number huge number of electrons which electrons will have the greatest kinetic energy after coming out so to leave the surface you must spend an energy equals to w naught now those electrons which are already present in the surface won't have to spend any amount of energy in reaching the surface because they are already on the surface so those electrons which are already on the surface for them w will be zero so they will have to spend the least to come out of the metal and if they have to spend the least amount of energy to come out of the metal after coming out of the metal they will have the maximum possible kinetic energy so for a surface electron we say that as the w becomes zero the energy of incident photon equals to work function plus k max sir why have you written k max do understand that we are not shooting one single photon we are shooting many of photons and there is not a single electron present there are many electrons present in the metals so many of the electrons will be coming out but the electron which after coming out will have the maximum kinetic energy will be the one which will spend the least to come out and that will be a surface electron and hence for a surface electron since w will be zero we can say that the energy of the incident radiation equals to work function plus the maximum possible kinetic energy of the electron after coming out now this is called the einstein's equation and for this equation he got nobel prize so let's now understand photoelectric effect in great detail now you can look at the timestamp right now in the lecture and this is the part i will say from where you should revise the whole apparatus of photoelectric effect experiment once more once i have completed explaining the whole so let's start experimental arrangement to observe photoelectric effect and this is where the really important part begins when light radiation of suitable frequency suitable frequency means of suitable wavelength and suitable energy because let's say if you have got a matter of work function 4 electron volt then to observe photoelectric effect the energy of the photons being incident should be greater than 4 electron volt if you bombard here photons of energy less than 4 electron volt it won't be able to take out electron and you won't be able to observe photoelectric effect so the least energy of the photons being hit here should be 4 electron volt so when light radiation of suitable frequency or suitable wavelength or suitable energy falls on plate c photoelectrons are emitted from c so this is the apparatus 
so there is a plate called c there is a plate called a so why c and a why not x and y reason we c represents cathode and a represents definitely sir anode so remember that in photoelectric effect the light falls on the cathode the electrons comes out of the cathode so radiation high energy radiation which have got sufficient energy to eject out electrons are bombarded on the cathode and once they hit the cathode electrons do come out of the cathode and once they come out of the cathode they start moving towards the anode so if the plate c is at zero potential with respect to plate a if you do not place any battery if the cathode and anode are at same potential very small current flows in the circuit because of some electrons of high kinetic energy reaching the plate a but this current has no practical utility so think that you have got this tube vacuum tube you haven't connected any battery between the cathode and anode you have bombarded photons on the cathode once you have bombarded the photons on the cathode of sufficient energy electrons will come out of it these electron move to the anode not all of them only some of them some of them fall back but due to some net negative charge exchange from cathode to anode inside the tube you will say that some current flows in the tube though this current is not at all significant second point if the plate a if the anode plate is kept at positive potential with respect to cathode plate so if you make the potential of anode plate positive with respect to cathode plate so you can think of negative charge on cathode plate and positive charge on anode plate now since now anode plate has got positive charge more and more electrons will be attracted towards the anode plate as more electrons will move towards the anode plate you will say that there is net negative charge flow from cathode to anode and this time it has a higher magnitude so if the plate anode is kept at positive potential with respect to cathode current starts flowing through the circuit because more electrons are able to reach the plate a why because now the plate a has got positive potential with respect to plate c so it will attract more number of electrons hence there will be more net charge transfer within the tube hence we will say that more current is flowing now bachcho next point as the positive potential of plate a is increased sir how do you increase the positive potential of plate a with respect to plate c let us see here we have placed a battery if we increase the emf of this battery it means that the anode plate becomes more and more positive with respect to the cathode plate so as the positive potential of plate a increases current through the circuit increases why because now more and more number of electrons will reach the anode after some time constant current flows through the circuit even the positive potential of plate a is still increasing so the statement says that if you increase the potential of a with respect to c first the current flowing in the tube increases but then it becomes constant why sir because there comes a situation when each and every single electron coming out of the cathode start reaching the anode for example think that if the radiation falling is such that 100 electron comes out of the cathode per second 100 electrons comes out of the cathode per second then no matter how high a potential you apply you can't get more than 100 electron on the anode per second because the maximum number of electrons that can reach the anode per second is the maximum number of electrons coming out of the cathode per second and the maximum number of electrons coming out of the cathode per second do not depend upon the strength of this battery it depends upon how many high energy photons have hit it so as the positive potential of plate a increases current through the circuit increases but after some time constant current flows through the circuit even as the positive potential of a is still increasing because at this condition 
all the electrons emitted from the plate C cathode have already reached up to the plate A. This constant current is called saturation current. So what we have learned till now, if we plot the graph of current in the tube versus the potential, when I write here potential, it means that potential of anode minus potential of cathode. Even when you do not apply any potential difference between cathode and anode, which was the first case, still some electrons coming out of the cathode reaches the anode and there is some current in the tube. So even when potential is zero, there is some current in the tube. And as you increase the anode potential with respect to cathode, the current first increases but then becomes constant. It saturates. Why? Because there is a cap on it. If let's say 50 electrons comes out of cathode per second, then no matter how high a potential you apply because of this battery, the maximum number of electrons that can reach the anode per second will be 50. So the maximum current that can flow in the tube will be the current associated to the charge flow of 50 electrons per second. That's why beta on increasing the anode potential, the current first increases, but then saturate becomes constant. And when the current saturates, it means that every electron coming out of the cathode has now started reaching the anode. Now tell me the saturation current depends upon the strength of the battery or the number of electrons coming out per second. Sir, the saturation current depends upon the number of electrons coming out per second. Second thing, the number of electrons coming out of the cathode per second depends upon what? Sir, it depends upon the number of photons being incident on the cathode per second. If the number of photons being incident on the cathode increases, then the number of electrons coming out of the cathode will increase and hence the saturation current will increase. So now let's look at the next point carefully. To increase the photoelectric current further, once it has saturated, if you even want more current, we will have to increase the intensity of the incident light. So if you want more photo current in the circuit, you will have to increase the intensity of the incident radiation because when more number of photons will be bombarded, more number of electrons will come out due to the photoelectric effect and then more number of electron will be able to reach the anode. Photoelectric current depends upon first potential difference between the electrodes. So when the potential difference between the electrodes is zero, we know that there is some photo current in the circuit, but that is not appreciable. On increasing the potential of anode with respect to cathode, we know that the current increases and then becomes constant. So the photoelectric current depends upon potential difference between the electrodes till saturation. Once the current saturates, then increasing the potential do not increase the photocurrent. So that's why till saturation has been mentioned here. Second point, the photoelectric current depends upon intensity of incident light. The greater will be the intensity of the incident light, the more number of photons will fall, the more number of photons will fall, the more numbers of electron will come out and greater will be the photocurrent. The third point, nature of the surface of metal. If let's say the metal has a high work function, it means that it is difficult to take out electrons. If the metal has a low work function, it means that the electron requires less energy to come out. So if you replace the same cathode with another cathode of lower work function, then for the same light source, you will get more number of electrons and you will get more photocurrent. Now, but Joe, the graph of intensity of light being incident versus the saturation current is linear. You double the intensity, double the number of photons fall, double the number of electron comes out and double is the saturation current. So you get a linear graph between the intensity of the source and the saturation current. Now the important part starts. To decrease the photoelectric current, the anode is maintained at a negative potential with respect to cathode. The so anode is maintained at lower potential, cathode at higher, so the battery should look something like this. 
Sir, by doing this, why will the current decrease? It's obvious. Now the cathode is at higher potential, so think of it as positive. Anode is at lower potential, think of it as negative. So the electron which has came out of the cathode, which are negatively charged, will be more attracted towards the positive cathode. Now since lesser electrons will move from cathode to anode, the current in the tube will decrease. So to decrease the photoelectric current, the plate A is maintained at a negative potential with respect to C. As the anode A is made more and more negative, fewer and fewer electrons will reach the anode and the photoelectric current will decrease. So the greater the strength of the negative polarity battery you place, the lesser and lesser number of electrons will reach the anode. Next point. At a particular negative potential of plate A with respect to C, no electron will reach the plate A and the current will become zero. This negative potential is called the stopping potential denoted by V0. So that potential, which if applied, even the most energetic electron coming out of the cathode can't reach the anode is called the stopping potential. Now let's take an example to understand what the stopping potential has to be. Let's say you have a cathode and you have an anode. And let's say the work function for this particular cathode is 2 electron volt. And you have bombarded this cathode with photons of wavelength, let's say uh, 200 nanometer. Can you tell me what has to be the potential of this battery so that the photo current becomes zero? It's easy to find C. You will say that, sir, okay, the wavelength of the photon being bombarded is 200 nanometer. 200 nanometer is same as 2000 angstrom, yes. So the energy of this photon being hit in electron volt will be given by 12400 upon lambda in angstrom. Yes, sir. Cancel out 0000. zero, zero, zero. Here you get 12.4, this becomes 6.2 electron volt. So the energy of the incident photon is 6.2 electron volt. We want that the photo current in the circuit to be zero. For the photo current to be zero, no electron coming out of the cathode should reach the anode. If you want that no electron coming out of cathode should reach the anode, it means that even the most energetic electron coming out of the cathode should stop before reaching the anode. What will be the kinetic energy of the most energetic electron coming out of the cathode? So the electron that has to spend the least to come out will have the greatest kinetic energy after coming out, right? What will be that kinetic energy? So sir, the minimum you have to spend is 2 electron volt. So the kinetic energy of the most energetic electron coming out will be equals to energy provided by photon 6.2 minus the minimum that you have to spend which is 4.2 electron volt. So the maximum kinetic energy of the electron coming out is 4.2 electron volt. But you don't want this electron to reach the anode. So it has to be stopped before reaching the anode. So the strength of the battery that has to be placed here is nothing but 4.24. Let me take one more example. Let's say you have got here cathode and this cathode has got work function of 10 electron volt. And you want the current in this tube to be zero when here the incident photons have got a wavelength of 100 nanometer. Tell me what will you place the stopping potential to be. So you will say sir very simple 100 nanometer hmm, is same as 1000 angstrom yes. So the energy of the incident photon in electron volt will be 12400 upon 1000 yes. That will be equal to 12.4 electron volt yes. So one photon that is being hit on the cathode has an energy of 12.4 electron volt. Out of this 10 0.4 electron volt at least 10 electron volt has to be spent because that is the work function so the kinetic energy of the most energetic electron coming out will be equals to 2.4 electron volt think over it this way the electron that will have the maximum kinetic energy after coming out will be the electron that has to spend the least and the electron that has to spend the least is the surface electron and even that has to spend 10 electron volt
and if you want this electron not to reach the anode it should stop before reaching the anode and to make it stop you have to place a potential of 2.4 volt and this 2.4 volt will be your stopping potential so what exactly is a stopping potential the reverse potential that if applied even the most energetic electron coming out of the cathode can't reach the anode now but moving on if we increase further the energy of incident photon kinetic energy of the photo electrons increases if we increase the energy of the incident photons the kinetic energy of the photo electrons increases the greater will be the energy of incident photon the more energetic will be the electrons after coming out and more negative potential should be applied to stop the electron to reach up to the plate anode think over it this way if let's say here you have got cathode and this cathode has got work function of let's say two electron volt case one you are bombarding with photons of wavelength 200 nanometer case 2 you are bombarding photons of wavelength 100 nanometer so when the wavelength becomes half the energy of the incident photon becomes double so if you bombard with photons of higher energy then ke max will increase if the energy of the most energetic electron coming out of the cathode will increase then you will have to apply more reverse potential to stop the electron from reaching the anode so if we increase further the energy of incident photon kinetic energy of the photo electron increases and more negative potential should be applied to stop the electron from reaching the anode plate now what is the relationship between stopping potential and ke max so to understand that the stopping potential is the reverse potential that has to be applied so that even the most energetic electron coming out of the cathode can't reach the anode so if ke max let's say comes out to be four electron volt what has to be the stopping potential four volt if ke max comes out to be 7.68 electron volt what has to be the stopping potential nothing but 7.68 volt so remember that bacho e times the stopping potential equals to ke max and this is something you should remember so if ke max is 6 electron volt then the stopping potential is simply 6 volt so easy so now let's revise some important points first a stopping potential depends only upon frequency or wavelength or energy of the incident photon it doesn't depend upon intensity of light so a stopping potential depends upon ke max Ke max depends upon two things. One, the work function. Second, the energy of the incident photon. A single photon. Ke max has got nothing to do with how many photons are being bombarded on the cathode. So, Ke max depends upon the work function of the metal and the energy of one photon. It is independent of the number of photons. So, once more, the stopping potential depends only upon frequency or wavelength or energy of one single incident photon it has nothing to do with the number of photons that's why we say it doesn't depend upon the intensity of light second bit we must remember that intensity of incident light radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the source so if you have got this cathode and you have a point source let's say at distance t if you make the distance 2d then the intensity at the position of cathode will become one fourth why sir because intensity is proportional to one upon r square when the distance becomes double intensity becomes one fourth but beta here two types of question will be asked if let's say for a particular setup the source distance a point source distance is made double what changes the saturation current or the stopping potential so do understand when you move the source away the number of photons hitting the cathode decreases but the energy of one photon remains the same since the energy of one photon remains the same and the work function of metal remains the same the ke max remains the same and hence the stopping potential remains the same but since 
on increasing the distance of the point source the number of photons hitting the cathode decreases the number of electron coming out decreases and the saturation current decreases so on changing the distance of the source from the plate the stopping potential remains the same while the saturation current changes so what you here we must remember that the intensity of incident light radiation is inversely proportional to the square of distance between the source and the cathode so we say that i is proportional to 1 upon d square or intensity of the light source which is directly proportional to the saturation current is proportional to 1 upon d square while the stopping potential remains the same so now it's time to discuss some important formulas the first one hf equals to hf not plus k max sir what is this see beta hf is nothing but energy of the incident photo hf not planck's constant times the threshold frequency is nothing but work function so we know that the energy of incident photon equals to work function plus k e max this is nothing but einstein's equation right and from here we can even write k e max which is same as e times the stopping potential can also be written as hf minus hf not or you can take h common and write h times f minus f not so k e max equals to e times the stopping potential equals to h times f minus f not these formulas come handy and they are not at all rocket science you know where they are coming from now but you can even write k e max as half times the mass of electron into speed of electron whole square so k e max equals to half m v max whole square next thing but you once you know that half m v max whole square can be written as h into f minus f not bringing the two up and m down and after rearrangement you can even write v max equals to under root of 2 h f minus f not divided by m okay quite easy thing next bachcho we can even talk in terms of wavelength we can say that ke max equals to half m v max whole square which is same as e times the stopping potential can also be written as sc by lambda minus sc by lambda not so think over it this way k e max the kinetic energy of the most energetic electron coming out equals to the energy of the incident photon sc by lambda minus the work function which is sc by the threshold wavelength and you can take the sc common and now you can use these two and write v max in terms of lambda so you will get v max equals to 2 hc lambda not minus lambda upon lambda lambda not divided by m under root nothing great here i am using the same basic equations and one more thing you can write stopping potential in terms of frequency and stopping potential in terms of wavelength so you can say that stopping potential can also be written as using this h into f minus f not divided by e or you can even write stopping potential in terms of wavelength and write stopping potential as hc by e into 1 by lambda minus 1 by lambda not nothing great here so these are some formulations you should be able to do no need to remember them you just need to remember the basic einstein's equation which is nothing but principle of conservation of energy now we will discuss some graphs as you know graphs are really important so graph between potential difference between the cathode and anode and photoelectric current so we have learned that even when no potential drop is applied between anode and cathode still some current flows when the anode potential is increased with respect to cathode the current increases and then saturates so this is about positive potential when the potential of a is higher than c but what if the potential of c becomes more than a so sir when the cathode potential is increased with respect to anode we have learned that lesser and lesser number of electrons coming out of the cathode reaches the anode and there is a particular potential which when applied in the reverse sense even the most energetic electron coming out of cathode can't reach the anode that potential is called stopping potential so the graph goes something like this 
So for this negative part, it means that Va minus Vc is negative. It means that potential of cathode is greater than anode. The current decreases and drops down to zero at a particular potential that is called stopping potential. So if you think of current versus potential, where we write V, it means that potential of anode minus potential of cathode. The graph goes something like this. And you get these three type of graphs. If you use the light of same frequency, so you get the same stopping potential, but of different intensity. Now from the graph, you can see that the saturation current in case three is greater than two is greater than case one. This means that the intensity of source in case three is more than two and that is more than in case one. So for different intensity of incident light having the same frequency, if the light has same frequency, one photon will have the same energy. The Ke max will be same and hence the stopping potential will be same. So all these three sources have got different intensity, but they have got the same frequency. Now let's think of another case. When the three sources have got different frequency, but they have the same intensity. So if they have the same intensity, you will get the same saturation current. But the case for which you are getting greater stopping potential, as you can three see stopping potential in case three is more than in case two and that is more than in case one. So the case in which stopping potential is higher, in that case, the frequency has to be more because if the frequency of the incident photon will be more, the photon is more energetic. So the K max will be higher and more potential has to be applied to stop the electron coming out of cathode to reach the anode. So if you get this case, you can say that the intensity of the light coming out of the three sources is same, but the frequency is highest for the one which has got greater magnitude of stopping potential. You can say from here that F3 is greater than F2 is greater than F1. So for different frequency of incident light having the same intensity. The next thing you should know is the graph between maximum kinetic energy and the frequency of the incident light and stopping potential versus the frequency of incident light. So first of all, let's talk about maximum kinetic energy versus frequency of incident light. So what does the graph goes like? So from the Einstein's equation, we know that the energy of incident photon equals to work function plus K e max. Yes, sir. So can I say that K max equals to energy of incident photon minus work function? Yes. In place of energy of incident photon, can I write HF? So we can say that K max equals to HF minus W naught. Now if on the Y axis I have taken K max and on the X axis I have taken frequency, this is the equation of straight line Y equals to MX plus C, where the slope M is nothing but H and C is nothing but negative of work function. So you get a straight line graph. And you can compare this low m equals to h. So you can say that tan theta equals to h. And the y intercept is nothing but minus of w naught. So the graph of Ke max versus the frequency of the incident radiation is a straight line. Do notice in the graph some part is shaded, dashed, and some part is bold. Why? Because there is a particular frequency for any frequency of incident photon less than this particular frequency, you won't observe photoelectric effect. So this particular point at which this straight line graph cuts the frequency axis, that frequency is the threshold frequency. Now our next mission is to draw the graph of stopping potential versus, versus frequency of incident light. We have learned that stopping potential is nothing but K E max upon E. E times the stopping potential equals to K E max. And in place of K E max, from the Einstein's equation, we can write the energy of the incident photon minus work function. In place of energy of the incident photon, you can write HF. So you can say V naught equals to HF minus W naught by E. So you get the equation the stopping potential equals to hf by e minus work function by e again the equation of straight line if you take v naught on the y axis f on the x axis then the slope is h by e and 
the y intercept is minus times the work function by e so think of the graph of stopping potential versus the frequency of the incident radiation you get a straight line this time the slope comes out to be nothing but h by e and the y intercept is minus w naught by e so that's all in this hour see you guys in next hour hope you have understood photoelectric effect really well and in the next hour we will talk about radioactivity see you guys bye bye so that's all for now see you guys in the next hour